Hi, this is Jim Cunningham. Today, we're going to talk about selling a business, maximizing sales price. That I think that is the thing. If you're selling a business, what's the number one thing that you're going to want to have in your favor for the vast majority of people? The very first thing they think about is sales price. I've got Matt Garrett here from TGG Accounting. And Matt presented a little while back. I'm in an organization he presented, has great content. I asked him to join us here so that he could share it with you. And selling a business. Um, you know, for many people, they build a business and they might only do it once. You know, you do have the serial entrepreneurs, right, Matt, where people will start a business and sell it and start and sell. But for a lot of people and a lot of our clients, they have built this business really over their adult life. And when it comes time to sell it, the big question is, how can I maximize sales price? And really, I think a threshold question is, um, can you sell it, right? Can you sell a business? And it's very important as you, as we go through the materials here, you're going to see, as Matt explains it, that numbers uh, aren't the most important thing. They are everything. So the numbers, when a buyer comes in, that is what the buyer is going to look at. They're going to look at profits, cash flow, safety, right? The, you know, how, how safe of an investment is this? And that drives a value of the business. I'm Jim Cunningham. I am a partner at Cunningham Legal. I have, this year marks 30 years experience as an attorney. I think I'm just going to say 30 years going forward. We have offices throughout California, and I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law. I'm a real estate broker, securities, insurance licensed, and a pilot. We represent a lot of business, a lot of small business, and not so small business uh, in, in the sort of the day-to-day -day operations, as well as when it comes time to sell your business. So that's part of our service offering. These are our lawyers in our firm, and we have offices in Northern and Southern California. And I'm very happy to have Matt here. And he is the CEO and founder of TGG Accounting, over 20 years of industry experience and specializes in small business accounting, taxes, bookkeeping, payroll, and more. He founded TGG with the mission of making business owners' lives better through excellent financial management, which I will tell you as a business owner, as a partner in a law firm, this is something we pay attention to multiple times a day, not just once, but multiple times a day. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, give us a review. I always like to see the comments in there. And uh, this is not legal advice. I'm a lawyer. You know, Matt's going to be talking. This is not advice to just go out and do a bunch of stuff based on what we said. This is information only and certainly not legal advice. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Matt. Um, I think as we go through the materials, I because when I watch a video, I'm like, what is really going on here? What are the things that I need to take away from from here today? And and I'll let you let you take it away. What you know, for somebody watching this, what should they be? What is what are the key takeaways? Yeah, I think, look, if you're thinking about selling your business, we want to get, as you said, Jim, the maximum value. You, you've got to show increasing profits, stable cash flow. A safe business is always more valuable than one that's volatile. Uh, and, and ultimately, the goal today is to help people grow the value of their businesses uh, if they're thinking about selling them. So um, job descriptions and review of financial. Who is this guy? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> this is the founder of accounting. The, the whole thing here is, uh, this guy founded the exact same system we use in accounting today uh, over 500 years ago for the Medici family, Luca Pacioli. And, and the importance here is to understand that accounting is black and white and there's a right and wrong way to do it. And when a potential buyer comes in, if they've seen you've done it the wrong way, your value is going to go down. Don't let accountants tell you, oh, we can interpret it this way or that way. That's tax. Tax accounting, there's lots of tax laws that can be gray. In, in financial accounting, everything is really black and white. And it's very important you get it right so that people understand and they can trust your numbers. So what is question, if you're watching this or listening to it, what's the small business success rate in the first five years? So you start a business as, and the, really the, the question is how many businesses are in business after five years, right? Is it? Yeah, really. What, it, what is it? Is it 20%, 40%, 50, 75? Yeah, some of it depends on industry, uh, but it's it, it, there's only 50% that will still be there Wow. Um, uh, after five years. And again, some industries more than others, but only about 50% in the first five years. It, it, yeah, it gets worse. <laughs> after one 10 years. In, one in three in the 10-year mark, and one in 12 small businesses failing every year, which is why if someone is going to go to buy a business, that safety component is so important. They have to understand what they're buying.
a lot of business owners have their net worth tied up in their business. And we see this a lot. Uh, they, you know, a lot of our clients come in, they might own a home and a business. They don't have retirement accounts. They don't have outside investments. They say, look, I can make more money turn, putting the money back into my business. Well, that's great. Maybe it's great while you have the business, but then when it comes time to sell, how are you going to extract the value? So what's it, what's a typical net worth? 78%. Yes. Is that yeah. real? It is real. And it represents me, honestly, Jim, I'm a business owner <laughs> just like you. And I will tell you about 80% of my net worth is tied up in our accounting firm. It's just, you know, as a business owner, you do pour everything in, which is why this is so important. You know, most people, you said there are serial entrepreneurs out there. That's right. And um, even serial entrepreneurs, most of their net worth is tied up in their business interests. So why do small businesses fail? What's what's the number one reason? Lack of cash is what they say. Is that what well, they, oh, it's what they say, lack of cash. cash. They say lack of cash, but I actually believe it's a lack of profits. And this these statistics will show you 40% of the businesses out there, uh, this is again, according to the Chamber of Commerce, are profitable. However, that's only 40%. 30% are consistently breaking even, which means that there's another 30% that are continually losing money. So you have to be in that 40% or you're not even going to be thought of as a business that's, that's worth selling. What is, so when, when you just taking a little bit deeper dive in this, does break even mean that the owner is getting a salary typically or not? Maybe. Okay. It may be, but the business is, the business effectively is, is, is at a net zero after all the work everybody's done. Yeah. It's interesting because sometimes I'll talk to people and they say, well, I have this business and it's, it's doing a million dollars a year and I'm taking home a hundred thousand. So this, this business is generating a hundred thousand dollar year profit. And then I ask him, well, how much would it cost to replace your labor in the business? And they go, Oh, it would be 150,000. Well, no one's going to buy that. I mean, they're buying a job that, that they can, they can get paid more going to work for a competitor. Right. That, that's right. Jim, the other side is also true that a lot of business owners run a lot of uh, business expenses through the, through their business. And it's very important in the accounting to segregate those out so that you can see the true profitability of the business. And I think you're identifying the difference between tax accounting and business accounting. So those are decoupled. And, and so if you're a business owner and you're listening to this, or you're watching this, just know that when your, your income tax return is, is not necessarily going to correlate with the, the profitability of your company, right? Should almost never because the tax laws change all the time. And remember those, those accounting rules haven't changed in 500 years, really. Um, so how many business owners who start a business successfully sell it? That's a really low number, 0.5%. That's a real number. It's a real number because if you do all that math, if you if you had 100 business owners, 50% don't make it to year five, one in three make it to year 10, one in 12 fail every year, about 30% of business owners never actually transact. And then you've got people who are unhappy three years after the sale because they didn't know what they were going to do after they didn't didn't get their financial needs met. They got into some earnout that never paid them the full value of the business. So yeah, about half a percent is actually satisfied with the sale after the sale from those who started. And the number one reason for sale frustration is mis missed expectations, right? That's I mean, right. That's exactly right. And as William Shakespeare said, expectation is the root of all heartache. So really a misalignment, you know, I want this price. The buyer says, I want this result. And there's just not an alignment. That's correct. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is know your value before you sell. And know what you need to get out of it. So that's where, that's where your firm comes in. So, you know, importantly, and, and other advisors is because you've actually got to know what you get after tax. It's not about, you know, it's, can I live with this? Can I live on this? Or do I need to go flip burgers? I mean, McDonald's is up to 20 bucks an hour now. So maybe that's a viable alternative. For some California, I guess. <laughs> if you can actually get a job, I think it's all done by robots now. Oh, that's, that's maybe true too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is interesting because a lot I meet with a lot of business owners and kind of a common number is about $10 million, you know, five to 10 million, something like that for business that, that's, that sells. But if you sell your business for 10 million and it's an S corp in California, you might end up with 5 million. That's so right. it's really important to pay attention to that because S corps are great. Um, uh, you know, your business operating as S corporation is great as an operating business. When it comes to selling the business, you have significantly fewer uh, options, tax planning options. You know, you do have some, 
but you have significantly fewer versus if it's in another entity or structured in a different way. So this is very important. And how many years in advance of selling the business should people really be paying attention to this, Matt? What, what would you uh, a minimum of three, uh, but I would say that you always want to run the business as if you could sell it the next year. Because if you do, you're going to be maximizing profits, safety, and value from day one. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that is a really big point is run your business as if you're going to sell it at any time. And if you really are thinking about selling your business, you really need to be meeting with your advisors probably at least six tax years before the sale. There are some things you can do that might take five tax years to um, – to permit you to have a little bit better tax treatment. So let's talk about small business fraud. Why are we talking about fraud? I guess we're talking about profitability and I guess fraud takes your profits, right? Is that why we're talking? Well, it's, it is the silent killer yeah. because a lot of people don't know they're being stolen from and it's a massive, massive problem. And if you're going to get five to seven times earnings, every, every dollar you miss out in an earnings, you're losing out on $7 of sale price. So it's incredibly important that we eliminate fraud or theft out of the business. You said something really important that when valuing a business, people are looking at how much, how much profit does this business kick off a year? That's right. The more profit you have, the more you're going to sell your business and it's a multiplier. So if you're, if your pro profits go up a dollar, you might put $7 more in your pocket, depending on the industry, you might put $7 more in your pocket in profit. And is there a size of business? You know, I mentioned this $10 million figure. What size of business are we really, do people have to really pay attention to these, to, to what we're talking about? I mean, what's kind of the, the starting point in size, would you say? Um, my, my core belief on this, Jim, is that business owners like you, you and me, it's our money. Yeah. Like it's every dollar matters. It doesn't matter whether you're a hundred thousand dollar revenue business or a hundred million dollar revenue business, every dollar matters. And that attitude permeates through your employees. And so I really believe that 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 it's not a size issue nearly as much as it is a uh, a discipline issue, and and making sure that we're doing it right from day one. But that's your problem right there. The average size of the fraud or theft in this country, this is according to the Certified Fraud Examiner's report, is one hundred twenty five thousand dollars per occurrence, which means it could be costing you upwards of a million dollars of value in your business if you go to sell because you haven't paid attention to the fraud or theft. That might just be what I call the leaky boat syndrome. People walking out the door with inventory. Oh, you know what? We gave just a little bit too much of a, a, a discount or we slid some money under the table to Johnny over there. You know, we, all right, we don't really worry about them taking out that in the back. No, there's all of this matters and it all adds up. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I've heard some, you know, you hear these axioms in in business and one is you know don't discount don't give away if you're if you're if your company is to manufacture widgets don't give away widgets why would you give away widgets you know you giving away your time or giving away something else um and that's one of the things we do in our firm is we do a lot of these videos because we're not selling videos right <laughs> but we're not giving away legal services so that's that's really important to understand um wow so let's just think about this so if you have fraud of 5% of revenue goes to fraud each year. That's revenue. That's not profits. No, but it's directly taking from profits. Right. Your and profits are 5% less as a percentage of revenue than they should be. Wow. Wow. So what are some common, um, you know, if you're a business owner and you're like, uh-oh, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. So Jim, what, let's talk what, what can people do to keep keep fraud from happening? I mean, one of the, the places where you and I might experience it is is the number one source of fraud or theft is payroll theft. People yeah. fudging their, pay, their their time cards, people fudging on payroll. Um, that's the number one place. The second number one is uh, asset misappropriation, where you end up, people are stealing inventory out the back. They're buying excess uh, and, and keeping some for themselves. They're misusing credit cards or gas cards. Um, those kind of things are, are incredibly costly. And then the ones that are with the giant companies are the ones that everybody hears about on the news, which are the fin financial statement frauds. That's the Enrons of the world. And those those have massive, massive losses, but they're the giant companies. We're really talking about our, our payroll and asset misappropriation schemes. Yeah, I was I was in a meeting a couple months ago and somebody was saying, you know, our cost, our, and it was construction, and their, co their cost of materials kept going up and up and up. And he's like, I don't understand. My cost of materials is going up. And everyone in the meeting was like, people are stealing drywall and two by fours and going doing, you know what I'm saying? They're yep, doing, doing jobs, on the side side. jobs on the weekend with all your materials. 
that's exactly what's happened. We're small tools for construction. That's a, I, I mean, construction industry, you really have to have good systems and processes to eliminate this stuff. Wow. Fraud lasts 14 months before detection. Yeah. Do you think that it's laziness, sloppiness? Is the people who are stealing good? Is it what, or maybe the systems aren't in place? Why, why do you think it takes? I think the number one problem is business owners are very focused on growing revenue and, and, and driving the growth of the business and not as focused on playing defense and defense in this case is a solid accounting department with awesome accounting systems and processes because you can't stop someone from stealing something, but you can catch them very quickly. Now, a lot of people in business say, the reason I'm in business is because I hate accounting. A lot of people, they, they see accounting and they're just like, I'm just, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to go yeah. and I don't even want to deal with accounting. What, what do you do if you don't want to deal with accounting and you're running a business? Or do you just have to suck it up and deal with it? Look, there's a lot of things I can't stand doing in my business, right? But when when you and I founded our businesses, we were the, we were the ones taking out the trash and we were the ones, you know, uh, sit, dealing with IT. I mean, how many business owners love IT? Unless you're in the IT, right? Yeah. And so I don't love accounting either, but you know what I love is money. <laughs> like I love winning. <laughs> and, and accounting is your scorecard that can tell you if you're winning. And ultimately, financial success is, is, is a big portion of why we do this stuff. Lack of internal controls. This is 33% of fraud. What, what do yes. you mean by lack of internal controls? What are this you is about? where, um, so uh, the stereotypical person who's stealing from you is likely an employee who's been with you for over eight years. Um, I, I don't mean to be sexist about this, but they are female, um, single mothers, and they're really hard workers, never take vacations, and they're the ones who write the checks and reconcile the bank account. That's a lack of an internal control. Because if you write the checks and you reconcile the bank account, you can steal very easily. If you're the one who's the one ordering and doing the inventory count, you can steal really easily. And, and the problem is, is the massive impact of this. Uh, you were just flashed that, that screen, but the massive impact of, uh, of, the, of the fraud or theft. Fraud or theft, if it's 125000 that's being lost, you have to sell $2.5 million of new revenue to make up for what was stolen. And that's what's crazy about this. So it's the it's it's getting the systems and processes right to eliminate it, and then putting the attitude in that says we're not every dollar matters. We're not letting people steal from us. Yeah, you say something really important. If somebody steals a, a dollar and you're it takes you ten dollars to earn a dollar in profit, you're going to have to do ten dollars more in sales. So it's not just earning another dollar. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a magnifying, massive magnifying effect. Um. Accountability through accurate accounting. Uh, who has accurate financials? And I would also say if they're accurate, are they timely? So those are two the sides of the of the coin. One in 50. How, where did you get this? Is this a made up number, Matt? So to be fair, on most of my statistics, I've cited sources. This is a made up number for my experience. I've been doing this for 20 years and I review financial statements. I probably review over a thousand set of financial statements every year. Um, for from businesses ranging from five million to hundred million in revenue, and I will tell you, I find about one in fifty are accurate. I can find real, like, um, measurable and impactful accounting mistakes in most sets of financials. And we we had a, a question here: What does Matt's firm do? And maybe you can talk a little bit about that because you're not a CPA, you're not an accountant by trade. What's what is your background? Yeah, we don't do any um, any tax, anything like that. Uh, we don't do any compliance work. Uh, what we do is we build accounting departments for people who want to have accurate numbers. They want to have all the controls in place, and they want them done, as you you pointed out, Jim, on time. So yeah, and, our guarantee and so, is accurate financials before the fifteenth of the following month. And and so it's different than because here's the kind of disconnect that, and this is why why I invited you to speak here. Because you'll hear, oh, uh, an accountant will say, well, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to have, and then, okay, well, how do I do that? And I think you're the glue that brings together all the different levels of accounting from, you know, CFO to controller to staff accountant um, and brings all of those people and has a basically a deliverable service to people rather than trying to assemble this yourself. Because I think, you know, it's one thing to identify what a person needs and, or what a business owner needs in their business. It's another thing about, well, how, how do I even accomplish this? How do I get it done? So I think you're, you're more on like the, how to get it done side, right? 
Our job is to lead the accounting department and deliver financial statements to you. We manage your accountants, teach, train them, et cetera. We put in people where necessary, um, but the outcome is, is, is mandatory and that is accurate financial on time. All right. So accrual accounting versus cash accounting. Cash accounting is a dollar came in and 90 cents went out and I end up with 10 cents at the end of the month. Yep. Accrual accounting is something different. What is accrual accounting? Yeah, accrual accounting is accounting for things when they actually happen. I'm going to say this one more time just because it's so important. Accrual accounting is accounting for things when they actually happen. So when did you earn the money, Jim? When you were billing by the hour, it's every hour you were working, not when you sent the invoice, because you might send January's invoices. It's February 1st today. You might not send them until February 5th. If you put it in the accounting system in February, we won't know how much money you made in January. So we got to do it and put the revenue in when you actually earn it in the time when you've actually incurred it. It's almost like two different languages. You know, it's almost like, you know, Latin and French and Latin and Spanish and Latin and German, right? You know, maybe in back in the ancient Europe, they all kind of spoke. These are just two different systems, right? And mm -hmm. I think as business owners, we get really focused on payroll. I know I'm focused on payroll because sure. if we don't pay our people, I don't think they're going to show up. Okay? <laughs> they're not, if you don't pay your people, yeah. nothing's yes. going to happen. So right? you don't pay your vendors, nothing's going to happen. So I think a lot of business owners get really focused on cash, but cash is really a result of everything that's accrued during a prior period. So I think it's something I didn't pay enough attention to when I was uh, a younger attorney and, and running a law firm. Uh, but I will tell you, this is what I pay attention to now. The cash follows the, the accrual. Very important. If you're just paying attention to cash. Now, this doesn't mean that you're going to file your income tax return on an accrual method. So when you are filing on a cash basis, that has to do with taxes. It's important. I mean, for some businesses, they should be cash basis for tax reporting, and some probably should be accrual basis. It depends on the business, but every business should track accrual, even if you're cash basis. So that's that's, That's kind correct. of the, the message I want I want to drive home. If you're a business owner watching this or listening to this and you're like, wow, I don't even know what accrual accounting is. I just pay attention to what comes in and goes out. I would suggest as a business owner, that's something you might want to think about paying attention to because paying attention to accrual accounting makes your business run better. And I, well, let's talk about this. People who don't run accrual when they go to sell their business, do they get a higher price if they run accrual versus not? If you're running an accrual basis, that's what every buyer expects. If you're running cash basis, you can expect at least a 30 to 50% discount on the value of your business. Accounting needs to be done by more than one person because if it's one person, it's a lot easier to commit fraud. If there are two people involved, that requires a conspiracy between two people. Yes. Which, and by the way, um, embezzlement is a crime. So it's not just, you know, not just you have to pay the money back. People go to jail for it all the time. Efficiency and accuracy. Yeah, you've got to have more than one person because there's activities that happen in accounting. And if you want timely data, you actually have to have people working concurrently. And there's also different levels of data. There's the data entry people, and they're the people who are reconciling inventory. And then there's the people who are doing cash flow forecasting. Those are three different people at three different levels. But if they're all working at the same time, you can get your financial statements on time. And what's a reasonable time to have your financial statements? I think you mentioned 15. The 15th 15 is mandatory. So what's to that? me, before the 15th of the following month is mandatory. Before the 10th is good. And before the 5th is, is rock star status and 100% possible for every business. And I think with cash, you a lot of people just run their business out of their checkbook, basically. And like, well, I got money in there. I'm doing fine. Yes. Problem is that it's easier. It's more timely. Uh, it's important because obviously you have to pay your bills. But I think you're missing the larger pic picture if you're not paying attention to the accrual. Agreed. Um, so is I, I I get it. I love that you know if you're if you're listening to this, you're not seeing the slide. If you're watching this, there there are two pictures. There's black and white. There's like a white and a black square, and then there's this fuzzy kind of um, psychedelic thing, which accounting's like, ooh, it's woo woo. I don't really understand it. Um, but it's not fuzzy. It's absolutely black and white, right? It is. And if you have an accountant that asks you where you should put something or where they should put something, and if they said, how would you like to treat this? You don't have a good account. You need to start over. <laughs> that account should be telling you, no, I'm not putting that in February. You earned the money in January. 
I'm not doing that because that's not the rule. <laughs> All right. The bottom line is for a lot of people, they say, well, the bottom line is this is the money that came in. This is the money, money that went out. This is what's left over. I think that's net operating profit, right? That's correct. Or net income, which is actually yeah. including all the other expenses that you might have in there that weren't operational. But yes. What else should we be thinking about? Well, to me, I like this triple bottom line because it tells the real health of the business from three different perspectives. How well am I operating the business that I set out to operate? How well is my business generating cash? And the net equity is really a measure of safety. Just like equity in your home, the more equity, the safer you are of not losing your house. Same kind of thing with the business. So one is a measure of operational efficiency, one is a measure of safety, and the third, cash from operations, is a measure of how well it's generating cash. Because we've, we've beaten up cash. Cash is king, but profits generate cash. So you got to look to profits first and then make sure those are generating the cash flow that you need to keep the business going. Some cash doesn't come from operations, right? You might be subletting space. You might be uh, interested in- Absolutely. Kind of or you might get a loan from a bank. Right. You know, hey, woohoo, we got tons of money in the bank. We just got $2 million. And you're like, that's awesome. But we took a $3 million loan. <laughs> right. Uh -oh. right. It's a problem. No, you've got it. Your operations have to be generating cash. All right. So let's talk about net operating profit. Uh, net operating profit is, uh, you have an example here, profit and loss statement. Maybe just kind of unpack this for us. Yeah, it's very basic. It's revenue, which is money you've earned. Cost of goods sold is the cost that it takes to actually produce your service or your product. And that gets you to gross profit. Then you've got all the other stuff, SG&A, also called operating expenses, that you subtract out of there to figure out how well you're operating the business. So you, your example here is $2 million in revenue minus cost of goods sold. So if you're selling widgets, you're reselling widgets, it's the cost of the widgets is a million sure. two. That leaves you your gross profit of 800. And then you've got your overhead with your you know payroll and your, your salespeople of 600,000. So that leaves 200,000, which gives you a 10% uh, really profit on the 2 right. million sales, right? That's correct. And, um, so in this, this is a great example. And I think you're going to talk about this. If you have $2 million in, in, uh, revenue and your net profit is 200,000, if you can decrease your cost by 1%, your profit goes up 10%. That's right. It's a magnifying effect. Magnifying effect. So if, how do you get those profits up? And the, and the profits is what the valuation is based on, right? So, because, exactly. uh, well, I mean, let's talk about valuation because some people say, oh, valuation is a multiple of uh, top line revenue, which is the money that comes in. Well, maybe. I mean, how often do you see that? Yeah, I, I see it as a triangle. So um, if I would said the accounting industry, I can speak to that pretty simply. Um, the multiple is 1.2 to 1.5 times revenue which also equates to five to seven times earnings, which <laughs> so you can kind of triangulate on a business and figure out they all kind of speak the same language. If you if you think about it, um, very few businesses in this world are sold off of revenue alone. Most businesses are sold off of profit. And money you earned is revenue and revenue minus cost of goods is gross profit. So in these terms, money you've earned, so this would be in that or two million dollar example here, what would be the revenue item that would be the that would be the total amount that comes in, right? It'd be the total amount you've earned, and to your point before, might not have been collected yet. Ah, right. And so it's money you have earned, not necessarily collected. Um, but some people get paid deposits ahead of time. We haven't earned that either. You right. now owe the people work services a product. So it's money you've actually earned, not not necessarily cash in the bank. To your point before. And cost of goods that you're selling? Yeah, one of the number labor. one places I see people make accounting mistakes is right, right here, is they don't put the right things in cost of goods sold. For example, in our businesses, our, our attorneys or our accountants, the people doing the work are our cost of goods sold. They're the direct labor. When you've got a construction firm, the guy swinging the hammer is the direct labor, right? When you got a manufacturing firm, it's the guy going, zzz, 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 putting all this stuff together. Right. Um, and so it's really important that you put all of those costs into cost of goods sold, because when buyers look at you, they benchmark you against everybody else in your industry, and they know exactly what those percentages should be that we were talking about before. And you've got to get this right, or they're going to give you a discount in price. And indirect label, labor might be like an HR person in a construction firm, right? Uh, no. So an in HR person is going to be in that SGNA or operating expenses in a construction firm. You're, uh, you've got a project manager that will go on site to multiple jobs. Yeah. That's your indirect labor. They're not directly swinging the hammer, but they're indirectly affecting the, the outcome of each job. 
So then a buyer can, if it, you should be breaking down direct and indirect label and probably in due diligence, if you don't do it, they're going to do it anyway. Right. And it's, right. Um, breaking this down because a buyer, I, I mean, buyers buy companies for a lot of different reasons, but somebody might be adding, like buying out a competitor and they say, look, I can buy out this competitor and I can perform the same services at a lower cost, meaning, you know, you have efficiencies of scale or whatever it is. And so that, that would be one reason people might buy a, uh, uh, why, why somebody might buy a company. So selling commissions is part of this SGNA selling general and administrative. Um, what's general, what, what kind of type of costs are in general? Yeah. So, uh, general are like rent overhead, um, you know, uh, office supplies, things like that. That's going to be general, general liability insurance. All that's going to be general. And then administrative is, is, is what? It is your accounting department. It's legal. It's your CEO. Uh, it's marketing. Um, and then this S stands for the sales and marketing. Uh, and, and really, I put commissions there because often people put commissions up in cost of goods sold, and it's not a cost of goods sold. It's it's part of this SGNA or operating expenses. So a four and a half percent increase in gross profit is. So this is a fun one. If you increase price by two percent and you yeah. decrease your cost of goods sold by two and a half, just get two and a half percent more efficient and increase price by two. That's what this is. They'll increase gross profit by 44 and a half, and you'll increase your net profit by 45%. So that this means is, the, yeah. the value of your business just went up. If it, if we came into this thing today, Jim, and somebody said, oh, the value of my business is 10 million bucks, and you can improve gross profit four and a half percent, likely the new value of our business is 14 and a half million dollars. So a lot of people would say, well, I don't want to grind my vendors and I don't want to just, you know, do this. It's like, well, it's just, I mean, it's hard work. I know these people, I feel bad, but what are some examples of how you can get a discount on, on maybe a one or 2% in a business? Yeah, so a really, a really good one. And people um, sometimes don't think about this is early pay discounts. If you pay or say, Hey, listen, I got a check. We're net 30. Normally I would pay you in 30, but I got a check for you. If I pay you in five or 10 days. Can I get a 3% discount? Can I get a 5% discount if I pay you early? If not, no problem. I'll pay you under our normal terms. But that's not grinding. That's an opportunity for them to say yes or no. And the people who say yes to you, you've just increased your profitability tremendously. And they've decreased their profit tremendously, perhaps. Maybe. Perhaps, perhaps, but maybe they have a choice that they have to make payroll, to your point before, and they need the cash in quick. There's a lot of businesses that are in that situation, and you're helping them out. Cash from operations. I think this is something certainly coming out of COVID where a lot of businesses got a lot of direct infusion from the government. Mm -hmm. I think this is something there might be some sick companies out there that are still around because they got an infusion of cash from, uh, from the government. So um, let's talk about a cash flow statement. Yeah. So a cash flow statement is, is really very simple when you think about it as, is this good or bad for cash? So you start with profitability and then you say, well, uh, my AR went up. So people owe me more money. Is that good or bad for cash? Well, that's bad for cash. They owe me more money. Uh, okay. And then I had to pay people early. Oh, that is that good or bad? Oh, that's bad for cash too. Uh, uh, but if you got to pay people late, that'd be good for cash. And if you collect it early, that'd be good for cash. And then at the end of the day, you're like, well, how much cash did I generate from operating my business? That's how you do that math. Days sales outstanding. Yes. Um, I believe that every business should track this uh, because buyers are going to perform this. And if you can show them the history, you're getting, again, increased confidence in that in that um, valuation. And it's very simple. What you're going to do is you're going to take your current accounts receivable, divide that by revenue for the month and multiply it to the days in the month. And that's your the, 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 the days it took you to get paid last month. That's how long it took you to get paid. And the shorter, the better. In general, yes, but it's very industry specific. Right. If you're working for Walmart and you get paid in 90 days, that might be great. Yeah. If you're working for, you know, if you're working in a restaurant and it's 90 days, you're in real trouble. <laughs> you're, you're, you're letting people eat for free. So there's yeah. the industries are very different. Um it's it's interesting that you highlight the difference between industries. So we're talking generalities and you you know you're you're highlighting the difference between somebody who sells to Walmart versus a restaurant. Yeah, th those are di really different industries, right? And so I think it's important if you're a business owner and you're listening to this or watching this, it's really important to pay attention to the particulars of your industry. And I know some industries and I want to circle back on this cash versus accrual. 
Some industries say, well, you know, my CPA says my business should be a cash basis bi basis business. And CPAs often, you know, if that's your tax compliance person, that's their focus. It's like for every hammer, there's a nail. And I'm not beating up on CPAs at all, okay? If you're, if, if you're running a business on a cash basis and you're going in every February or March to get your taxes done, and that's the extent of your accounting, you might want to think about looking at the accrual and be looking at this every month, not necessarily with your CPA, perhaps with your CPA, but I think, Matt, that is the that's the space that you fill is people go to you in addition to their CPA because you're not doing taxes, right? So someone would be keeping their CPA, going to somebody like you and saying, Matt, I need help setting up my accounting. I don't even know how to do this. Can you just come in and make sure this gets done? That's exactly right. And I would tell you that, that the CPAs, we should be sharing financials with the CPAs at least quarterly or semi-annually because the tax laws are changing all the time. And we want CPAs to help us figure out how to pay the least amount legally that we have to in tax. Balance sheet. How often should people look at their balance sheet? Every month. Every month. This is a measure of safety. Did you get safer? Net equity went up. You got safer. Net equity went down. You probably didn't. You probably got more risky uh, and, and have a bigger chance of going out of business. Other helpful, uh, and really these are, this is called KPI, key performance indicator. These are things to look at. Um, you know, in, in, we happen to be doing this where there's a big storm, a big pineapple express storm coming into where Matt's in San Diego and I'm up in Northern California and it's, it's hitting California. Well, one key indicator of whether it's going to rain is barometric pressure. Typically when barometric pressure drops, it's a rain, it rains coming in. There are similar indicators in business and so maybe talk about your this this current ratio what what are you talking about here current assets divided it's by a, liabilities i've never used that analogy and i love it um Jim, that was fantastic uh if, if this is a measure of liquidity and so your stuff current assets are stuff that's coming in cash that's coming in current liabilities are stuff that's sucking cash out of your business so uh payroll liabilities sucking cash out of the, out of the business accounts receivable going to bring cash into the business and you put the stuff coming in greater than the stuff going out. So if your ratio is less than one, you're going to go out of business. You're going to run out of cash. If it's just one, you're right on the verge. So we really want to think about, again, industry specific, what, how safe is your business and what is the current ratio that you think is appropriate to increase the safety of your business and why this is important in selling your business is because people pay more for safe businesses. They don't want those statistics about businesses going out of business to impact their buy. They want to be safe. Also, if you're going to get a loan from a bank, there's something called a debt service coverage ratio. So yeah. the banks want to know your income from operations is what they're paying attention to. And they want to make sure that you have enough income. And typically it's going to be beyond what the loan payments are, right? For that given year, that's a right debt service yeah. coverage ratio. Can you make these payments? So you might have, and this is important to understand, you might have really good credit. You might have credit in the 800s. But if your business can't support the debt service coverage ratio, you might not get a loan, um, a business loan, unless it's a personal loan, right? So that's a, 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 a distinction there. So KPI, very important. Customer acquisition value. So how much can you spend to acquire a customer? If you watch Shark Tank, and I mentioned this from time to time on these videos, they always talk, they talk about the same things over and over again. And I love the disclaimer. It's like, no one's giving you an offer. Kind of like, <laughs> no one's giving you legal service. But how much does it cost to get a client, right? And, and I think this correlates with lifetime value of a client and revenue per client. But what is customer acquisition value? So customer acquisition value is, is how much does it cost for me to get a client? And then how much profit am I going to make off that client over the life of a customer? Um, this is fundamental to a buyer's looking at your business. They're going to look at what is the average lifespan of a customer? How often are they recurring? Because again, safety, a recurring customer is a lot easier to get than a brand new one. And then what does it cost to actually get a brand new one? And then how long do they stay? And what can we anticipate in profits? These are all making your businesses much more predictable. Uh, and if they're more predictable, again, they're worth more. Yeah, I mean, th this is why certain businesses trade at different multiples, right? So a self-storage unit might trade at a higher multiple because people park their stuff in a self-storage unit and they keep paying $100 a month, you know, and they stay there for 10 home. years and realize, right. oh, what do I have in here? <laughs> or mobile home parks. Those, you know, people aren't picking the mobile. I'll put that in air quotes. I don't think those things are going anywhere and people have to live somewhere. So those typically trade at a higher multiple than a business where, uh, you know, you might be trading in gold, you know, when that was kind of a thing for a while that that's, you know, once you trade in your gold, it's, you're kind of one and done. 
That's right. Um, and so those those typically would come in at a at a lower multiple. Your number, this is a big one. Um, we talk about this a lot in estate planning. And I ask, you know, for those of you who have met with me uh, on estate planning and uh, or somebody in our firm, one of our questions is, what's your number? And it's funny because a lot of times we meet with spouses and the spouse who's kind of the driving economic force, a lot of times there's like one spouse who's really, you know, money driven and the other one is to a certain extent along for the ride. Um, the one who's kind of along for the ride goes, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What's your number? And the driven one's like 20 million, 10 million, 8 million, what, like it, it's, it's immediate and it comes out. And I will say if your number, you know, it used to be, you had to have 4 million to retire. And some people say 10, I think it depends on how much you spend. But what I do find Matt is that number, like once somebody, if they say my number's 10 and they hit 10, they go, well, my number's 15. It kind of creeps up. It uh, changes. So. So number, we're talking about number to stop working, right? Sell your business and retire, which I know is the R word. A lot of people don't like it, uh, but retire in this context means stopping work uh, for money, basically, and living off the sale of your business. So what help help us understand what you're talking about here by your number. Yeah. So I think a couple of things that are important and you're right. It's financial freedom. It's not necessarily retirement. I'm not sure you or I will ever retire, but It'd be you know, nice not to have to worry about money. And that's what this shows. It's a very simple formula. I do believe that you start with your monthly expenses, multiply them by 12, double it and add a zero. That's the net worth you need on an after-tax basis. So to go back to something you said before, if you sell your business for 10 million and you do it incorrectly, you might only end up with five. Most people will end up with somewhere around seven after tax. So if that's the case, is that enough for you to live on? You've got to make sure you have enough um, and that's why a lot of people are unhappy with the sale of their business. Going back to that half a percent thing that we talked about before. Um, so you sell your business. That's the successful exit. Uh, yep. Not necessarily retire, but move on to the next chapter of your life. And so you are doing something. I cannot believe you're doing this, Matt. You are offering a free 30-minute financial review. They can reach out to you. And how do they reach out to you? Um Let's see here. Let me see. I think here. Ashley put that in the uh, Ashley. I think she put that in the chat there. Yeah. Yeah. Ashley's going to put this in the chat. And if you're looking at this online, you can go into the notes and, and click the notes. Uh, it will be in the notes, but Ashley's got it in the chat. And uh, I went through this exercise with Matt, and it's a very valuable exercise. So I went through it for for my own uh, for Cunningham Legal. And it, it's really good. And and I you are probably gonna get a lot of people reaching out to you, Matt. You're we might have to pull this one down. <laughs> down <laughs> but um but this is a really good exercise i would say and if you're a business owner i would really encourage you to to take advantage of this and what matt does is a very i think a very um it's it's a service that i think a lot of people need and a lot of people don't know they need it so this is one of those unknown unknowns a lot of people they just go hey i do my taxes every year i pay attention to you know my profits i'm in business i'm good to go I'm telling you, you should think about doing this accrual counting. You should think about looking at your finances more than once a year. Look at a monthly. Don't just look at the balance on your checkbook. So I would re really encourage you to reach out to Matt. Um, very, very knowledgeable resource. And um, when it comes to estate planning and when it comes to the tax side of this, getting an A team together and on the tax side, let's say you, you go through all of this, you have a successful exit from your firm, from your company. You really need to be maybe looking at this at least, I would say, six years in advance, three maybe. But if you're going to change the way your company is taxed or, or do some type of restructuring, a lot of times it's a five-year um, kind of a hold period. But this involves the, the estate planning attorney, CPA, and financial advisor. It's the three-legged stool. If your assets, if you're single and your assets are over $5 million or married and over $10 million, you might benefit from what we would call some advanced estate planning because that is going to be a taxable estate in 2026. We have offices throughout California in Northern and Southern California. And Matt, you're located, you're fully remote and located mostly in California, right? Uh, we've got people all over the country, but we are fully remote. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so we've got clients, uh, literally 350 clients all around the country. Wow. Subscribe to our YouTube page and uh, please give us a, a review and uh, click the little bell and you'll be alerted when we drop our, our webinars. Next week, we are covering what happens if you die without a will in California. If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have just seen this video. So we're kind of going a little bit. It's like back to the future. I can't even get it straight in my head. 
but this is next week. Go ahead. Uh, there's a link in the um, in the chat and there's a link in the description of the video. You can click that. This is really important because if your estate plan fails, if it's like a catastrophic failure, this is where your assets are going. So if your trust is done so horribly that a judge just throws it out, your living trust, which ideally does not happen with our firm, right? But if you're if it is a real cluster, as they say, uh, you need to pay attention to this because many times this is how property is distributed in California. Uh, certainly if you don't have a will and sometimes if you have a, a poorly written or, or executed uh, estate plan. So we're gonna open it up for questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just keep watching because another video is gonna roll right up after this one. Thank you, Matt, for uh, spending time with us here today. We're gonna do questions offline that will not be posted uh, on our YouTube. And by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube and say, gee, I really have questions. I would like to know something. Come to one of our webinars because we do Q&A at the end. So keep watching. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thank you, Jim.